Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in the book of Mark, chapter number six. How many of you are a little nervous? Doesn't have to mean terrified or, you know, overly anxious, but how many of you are a little nervous when you are flying? How many of you a little bit nervous? Of, okay, so lots of hands went up. Does it give you a little more anxiety when the, the unexpected light comes on, that is the fasten your seatbelts light, and then the captain's voice comes on and he says, this is your captain speaking. You may have noticed that I turned on the fasten your seatbelt sign because there's a storm ahead and we're going to be in a little turbulence. So fasten your seatbelt, hold on, things are about to get crazy. I mean, does that make you a little bit nervous? Well, I, I suspect that if the captain says there's going to be some turbulence, it, it may make even the most seasoned traveler at least a little more aware about what may be ahead. Have you ever been traveling through a storm before where you, you just couldn't even see where you were going? The rain is pounding so hard the, the lightning crashes and you, you know, the thunder rolls and you just see we are in a bad storm. Have you ever been in a storm so bad that you had to pull over because literally your visibility was bound to basically zero? And then have you ever been in the kind of a storm that actually while you're traveling, the storm overtakes you? In other words, it came from behind you, and now you are literally traveling with the storm, wondering, when is this thing going to end? I suspect that as part of life, so life is a, a part of storms. It's not all of life. Sometimes it's a season of life. Sometimes it is a storm that comes and then passes. And, and then we have these moments of calm and relative tranquility, peace. And then as time goes on, additional storms. Since we're asking the question, where are you headed? Today, we answer that question with into a storm. Your Bibles are open right now to Mark chapter 6. Let's begin reading in verse number 45. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse number 45. And just before we read the verse, let's give some brief context. The disciples had been on one string of victorious experiences after another. The most recent of which is what we refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. Sometimes we refer to it as the feeding of the thousands because the Bible specifically calls out that, that those that were fed were 5,000 men. And then we would understand that there are additionally uh, others, women and children. This is the feeding of the thousands. And these thousands were fed with five loaves and two small fish from, from a little boy's lunch. If you want to talk about what we would refer to as a mountaintop experience, this is clearly one of them. So what happens on the heels of this mountaintop experience? Verse number 45, Mark chapter 6. And straightway, he, that is Jesus, constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. 
But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Where are you headed, we ask, and then the answer for us today is into a storm. The first thing we're going to notice about this passage and specifically about the disciples is what we'll refer to as the descent, the descent. Now, it's quite likely that the place where Jesus fed the thousands was, was on a hilly area, but, but that's really not the point as far as the descent down into the boat and, and into the sea. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the descent has to do with, with, I don't know, what we sometimes just commonly refer to as those mountaintop experiences. We're coming off from some kind of an emotional high, some kind of a spiritual pinnacle where, where, man, we have experienced one glorious view of God after another. We've seen him work and move and, 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 and insert himself into the normality of life in ways that are clearly of God. It's quite possible that the reason Jesus constrains his disciples into the ship is because, again, at another point, the disciples may have been caught up in the exuberance of the crowd. I mean, the crowd is, is like, who doesn't want this guy as a king? I mean, th this is the guy, we've heard about the miracles and, and one after another after another of the miracles. Do you remember when the four friends brought their friend and they lowered him down before Jesus and he, and he heals the, the man that's lame? Do, do you remember the time when Jairus comes and he says, my daughter's sick and Jesus raises a dead girl back to life again? Do you remember when he's dealing with the demoniac of Gadara and he casts out the legion? I mean, these stories are, are well known, and now he feeds the thousands with a little boy's lunch? Who doesn't want this guy for king? And it's quite possible that what's going on here is there is a crowd that is about to say, come on, disciples, let's make this man king. And, and here they carry Jesus against his will, shouting, long live the king. And so Jesus constrains his disciples. The crowd's still there. He constrains his disciples into the ship. No, you guys head over. You, you get over to the other side. And then Jesus, we, we don't know all that he said. We don't know the way he acted. All we know is that Jesus himself disperses the crowd. Look at Mark, verse number 44, chapter 6 again. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men, and straightway he constrained his disciples into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. Two things. First of all, Jesus acted immediately. That word straightway is a theme throughout the book of Mark. You see it, you see it continually throughout the book. There's some action that Jesus is taking immediately. So who doesn't want to bask in the glow of the mountaintop? Sometimes I, I suspect that the Lord does allow us these moments where we just get to stand back and say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. But then I also suspect that there are times when he says, okay, we've got additional work to do. You can't live forever on yesterday's miracle. God says, okay, it's time to come down off these mountaintop experiences, and he compels them into the boat. There are more towns, more people, more miracles. There is an awaiting cross that is before him. And so Jesus straightway, and then not only does he act immediately, he acts forcefully. He constrained by force is what the word means. Some may have asked, why did you leave the master alone? And they may have responded with, he, well, he left us no choice. How many of you have ever heard the expression before, a Hobson's choice? Have you ever heard the expression before? Not many. There's, there's something that at times we refer to as a Hobson's choice. And it's really a free choice, but you only have one option, okay? 
Years ago, I was having a, well, the reason it's called a Hobson's choice is, is, is back in the, the Old West, a guy named Hobson had, um, had horses. He had a whole, whole stable of horses and, and about 40, but people would come and they'd want the fastest, the best horses. So Hobson began to do a thing. He said, listen, um, yeah, do you want a horse? You get to choose one. Well, what can I choose from? This one, okay? And so that was the only choice they got. Years ago, I was traveling and had a meal in a person's home. And I remember it very distinctly. They said, what would you like to drink? And I responded with, what do you have? And they said, water. And I said, I'll have water, okay? That's a Hobson's choice. It's, okay, what, what do you want to do? But really, you're not getting a choice. I don't know that Jesus said, hey, do you want to go to the other side? You're going to the other side. Do, do you know in your Christian life, God doesn't always give you a choice. Oftentimes, he just presents the next thing before you. Now, we would be wise to choose what he is choosing. But so often, what he puts before us, we don't get to choose. J Joseph doesn't choose Egypt. It is, in a sense, chosen for him. The only choice left for him is, am I going to trust God or not? You're often left with no choice about cancer, no choice about an unfaithful spouse, no choice about a wayward child, a lost job, a broken relationship. Yet God is providentially doing the choosing. And in our journey with him, this often brings about a journey into a storm. The first thing that we see in this passage is the descent. Look, look at what that leads to with the disciples. We'll call that the despair. Well, they have the descent. They're, they're off their spiritual mountaintop. They're in this boat. And now look what that brings. It actually brings despair. Look, beginning at verse number 47, Mark chapter 6. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is it that actually created the need? Who knowingly placed them in a situation? And I use the word without any reservation, who knowingly places the disciples in a position where they are going to be in great need. That they understand we're in a perilous situation. Who put them in that situation? Is Jesus omnipotent or is he not? Does he know about the storm that they're going to face when he puts them into the boat? Well, he knows well about the storm. And yet the disciples now find themselves in a position of great despair. It is a need. Listen to some of the words that are used to describe the word toiling. They're in the middle, toiling. Here's what the word means. It means to vex with grievous pains of body or mind, to torment distressed. This is the situation of the disciples. And how often does God place us in positions where our needs are accentuated? We always have needs, but we don't always realize just how needy we truly are. Need reveals both what we are made of and what he is made of. For the first time in the Gospel of Mark, he records the time with the disciples in the boat. So the first time that we see in this Gospel, they're out in a storm, they're, they're, they're in a boat, and Jesus is with them. But not this time, not the second time that Mark records them out in the sea, in a boat. Now they are left to themselves. At times, we might go through some storm and it's like, hey, hey, listen, I'm okay. It's like when you were a kid and you're riding in the car and, and you look up and dad's driving and the, the windshield wipers are going. And I, I, I have this vivid memory, this childhood memory where I'm in the back seat. You know, back then, honestly, you know, you didn't wear seat belts back then. In fact, back then you tucked the seat belts underneath the seat because they got in the way, all right? And I can remember I'm laying in the back seat, we're driving and we're in this big storm and I'm asleep in the back. And I can remember waking up and I'm looking in the wipers, you can hear the rhythm of the wipers and the rain pounding on the, the roof of the car. And, and I can remember looking up, seeing the wipers and then just looking at dad. 
And there he is at the wheel. He's right there. And then I just like back asleep again, you know, because dad's at the wheel. Now, clearly, if that would have been me and I look up and the wipers are going, the rain's coming in and nobody's at the wheel, that would be a different story, okay? In a sense, that's what the disciples are experiencing. Jesus was in the bow in our storm the first time, but he's not here right now. They're in the, the middle of the night, the, the, the time of night when the, the darkness of the night, the, the thickness of the storm, we don't even know where we're headed. Why is it that at times God places us in darkness? Do you know, darkness actually, for a believer, there are some advantages to darkness. You say, well, well that sounds counterintuitive. Do you know the first thing that darkness does? Darkness forces us to remember. Darkness forces us to remember. The Bible says it this way in Isaiah chapter 50, verse number 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? Listen, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon. That means lean upon his God. Listen, are you in a time of darkness? You have no light. It forces you to remember. Okay, what do I know to be true about God? What has God revealed to me in the light that I now lean on in the darkness? I mean, seriously, don't many of you know your way around in the darkness? I mean, how many of you can just reach for a certain thing or, or navigate through a certain space? How many of you like, man, I know exactly where I'm going unless mom like moved the furniture or something, you know? You just know in the darkness, I can get to certain places. I can hit the switch. I can go to the place. I got the doorknob. I know my way around. Do you know what darkness does? It forces us to remember. There may well be times when God says, now listen, I'm doing this for a reason, I'm going to remove for a moment, I'm going to remove some light that you've come to rely upon. What is it that you know about God because he revealed it to you in the light that you can now lean upon in the darkness? What else does darkness do? Well, it forces us to remember. It also focuses our attention. It focuses our attention. In the darkness, the pupil of your eye begins to just expand, allowing as much light as possible to get into the retina. Uh, it's trying to gather any light that is possible. Do you know one of the things that darkness does? Our eyes begin to adjust and we look for any light that may be there. We start to see things that in the light, we may have just casually passed by. We start to notice things that, that in a normal circumstance of life, we may have just kind of casually glossed right over. And God says, you know, I'm gonna put you in a time of darkness right now. And you're going to be so attuned to what I'm doing. You're going to see things now in the dark that you may have never been able to see in the light. And what else does darkness do? Well, sometimes, just to be honest, it fans our fears. We start to imagine things. We, we start to think there are things. You, you know, it causes us, I think, at times to play that what if game. What if this happens? What, what if this happens? We start to ask all of these different scenarios running through our mind, the what ifs of life. The disciples were asking, what if we don't make it? What if we never see Jesus again? What if water starts coming into the boat? What if? And you and I play the same game. We, we run these scenarios through our mind. What is it that we have to do at those moments in darkness? Okay, stop playing the what if game. In other words, go to the what is reality. What is, Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and my song. He is become my salvation. He is my God. Psalm 62, 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Stop playing. If you're in a time of darkness, stop playing the what if game and start living in the what is reality. 
Well, we see a couple of things. First of all, the descent. We see the despair. Now, notice something that, that sometimes causes us to scratch our heads. Notice the delay. The delay. Your Bibles, again, are open, Mark chapter 6. Look beginning in verse 46, and then we'll read into the first part of verse 48. And when he had sent them, that is, the disciples away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. Jesus went, first of all, alone into a mountain to pray. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but suffice it to say that while we don't know what he prayed, we know that Jesus prayed. And we understand additionally that Jesus knew there is an urgency to my request. Many times, in fact, in the book of Mark, we see Jesus praying on three different occasions. And on the other two, they're both surrounded by by times of, of some imminent great occasion before him. And so Jesus, again, we don't know all that he prayed. But we do know that Jesus understands, I must have time with the Father. And so he sends the multitudes away and he goes alone to pray. And then don't miss this. Although Jesus delayed responding to his disciples, it does not mean that he was unaware of their need. He simply knew it wasn't yet the right time. He does not respond. He he knows that they have a need, but he doesn't respond immediately. I I don't know what you're like, but sometimes I I am an over-responder. In other words, I I see a need, and rather than say, okay, let's just back up a little bit, and let's let's see how is it that they work through this need. Sometimes, to my fault, I just want to relieve the problem. I want to address the need. Let's fix everything. But God in his wisdom doesn't always do what I do. God in his wisdom sees the disciples toiling and he pauses, he waits. Why is it that he's not just advancing quickly to address the problem? When he saw them toiling and rowing. Might I say, don't ever believe that that Jesus is unaware of your need, your trial, your distress, your circumstances. You may be toiling, but he is not unaware. He is simply waiting, waiting for the right moment to bring deliverance. Deliverance will come not a moment too soon, not a moment too late. Just don't mistake his delay for his disinterest. Nothing could be further from the truth. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 18. In fact, if you're jotting things down, or if you even jot things down in the margin of your Bible, this would be a great passage of Scripture to take note of because it helps us understand, God, why would you wait? The Bible says in Isaiah 30, verse 18, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed, listen to this. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Therefore will the Lord wait for what purpose? Only for the purpose that he may be gracious unto you. And then guess what happens? He's exalted. And then he says, listen, blessed. There's a reward for all those that wait for him. Listen, are you in the midst of a storm? Don't you bail on your belief that Jesus Christ is aware of your need. He is delaying not because he is an uncaring or unaware God. Therefore, will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Well, the delay we see, we we see the descent, the despair, the delay. But look again at verse number 48 when we start to understand the deliverance. Verse number 48, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. Now pause for just a moment on those words. There are so many today that try to unravel scripture. 
There's no way, you, you can look at that passage and um, if you do any honest study in the language with which this is given, there is no other option than to say that Jesus was walking on top, literally on top of the water. There, there are those today that say, well, that means Jesus was kind of walking on the shore. He was kind of following along. You look at the passage, Jesus is actually demonstrating who he is. He is God of very gods. And he's demonstrating that by walking on top of the water. Look a little bit further. It says he came walking on the sea. You might want to take note of this. We'll address it in just a moment. And would have, that little phrase means, and would have, and desired to, desired to pass by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Okay, so... So first of all, there can be no doubt, no question about who it is that's coming to the disciples. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is walking on the sea. There's only one person that can do that. And that is God. In Job chapter 9, verse number 8, the Bible says this, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Isaiah 43, verse number 16, Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Let it be known that Jesus walks on water to his disciples. He is walking where only God can walk. He is walking on top of the very thing that is their travail. The very thing that is their fear, that they're like, well, what happens if? This is the very thing that Jesus is now conquering, demonstrating I am on top of your fear. Simply stated, he is bigger than their trial. And he's bigger than yours and mine as well. He's bigger than the loss of your loved one. He is bigger than the loss of your health bigger than the loss of income or relationship or family or future or whatever. He is bigger than your trial. Then he waits for the disciples to see him. The very thing that they fear, they, they cry out for fear. They thought they had seen a ghost. This is the very one that is about to save them. And now there's no delay. Once they cry out, notice the words that are used next. Immediately, as soon as they cry, immediately. It's the same Greek word that we see throughout the book of Mark for straightway. Immediately, he talked with them. The loving Savior that looked on the multitude with compassion now looks on his disciples with the same. And then notice how he reveals himself to his disciples. It says again, verse number 50, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, be of good cheer. And then you might want to circle these words if you do so in your Bible. He says, it is I, be not afraid. Jesus reveals himself to, to his disciples in two ways in this passage. The first thing that he does is he reveals his name. Jesus reveals his name. James R. Edwards in his commentary wrote, walking on the lake identifies Jesus unmistakably with God. This identification is reinforced when Jesus says, take courage, it is I. The Greek, it is I, ego am I, is identical with God's self-disclosure to Moses. Oh, 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 who should I say that sent me? You, you would say it in Greek, it is I, or I am, just as God reveals himself to Moses. This Jesus not only walks in God's stead, he also takes his name. The first way that Jesus reveals himself to his disciples is he says, I am. You know who I am. He's saying to his disciples, I am God. So he reveals his name, and then notice what else he reveals. He reveals his glory his glory. Remember, Jesus is the express image of God. He that hath seen me, Jesus said, hath seen the Father. Okay, has the, the little phrase ever troubled you that he, he was about to pass them by? He desired to pass them by. He would have passed by them. 
Does that phrase ever trouble you? Like, like here are the disciples, they're toiling in the ship and, and they're, they're, they're not making any progress and, and they're afraid and, and now Jesus is walking and he's just like kind of walking on the water and he's, he's about to pass them by. Have you ever thought like, man, there are times when I feel like, Jesus, I'm in the middle of the sea and the winds are raging against me and, and sometimes it feels like you just pass me right by. Let's get some helpful context for that expression that he would have passed by them. It's in verse number 48. It's right at the end of the verse. Um, He was walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. The words would have, it means desired to. Passed by. Okay, now let me ask you, if you're thinking today and you're processing a little bit, where else in reference to God do we find that expression passed by? Okay, here's a, here's a little help if you're struggling with where do we see that? In Exodus chapter 33, verse number 22, Moses had made a request of God. And notice how this begins to unfold. And it shall come to pass, Exodus 33:22, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 11, Elijah had, had, had been fleeing for his life into the wilderness. And, and there the Bible records 1 Kings 19, verse number 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Does this mean that Elijah is out there and and it's like God just, whoop, hey, Elijah, here I am and now I'm gone and, and I'm on my way? Or does this mean something else when God passed by? And when God passed by Moses, does that mean that God is uninterested? Does it mean that God's got something better to do? That, hey, I'm, I'm on a mission. I got some place to be. Or does it mean that God is revealing something about himself to his servants that he wanted them to see when he passed by. The Bible says that he desired to, Jesus, who says, I am, that Jesus is about to pass by. He desired to. What does he desire to do? And here's what I believe this passage is saying. Jesus desired for his disciples to get a glimpse of the glory of God And they could get that glimpse through no other means at that moment than in the midst of the storm, seeing Jesus ride upon, so to speak, the waves to make a path through the sea, to go on top of their difficulty and their problems. In the Old Testament, God seems to veil his glory. But now in the New Testament, Jesus is boldly declaring it. He says, it is me. And as John wrote, they beheld his glory. And then he speaks a word of comfort. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Do you know what Jesus does? He's so aware of our need. He's so understanding of our frame. that They they cry out for fear. Listen, he already saw them when they were toiling. He's he's on the mountain praying. Would it be strange for us to think that he was actually including them in his prayer? So he knows them. He goes walking to them. He waits for them to see. They cry out for fear. And then he just reassures. In the middle of the storm, he's not yet in the boat, but he gives them a word. It's me. Don't be afraid. It is I. And and then he comes to them. And then he, he climbs into the boat, into their circumstance, into their reality, into their fear. And now all is well. Because Jesus is is in the boat. Do you know what he's doing? He's delivering them. Not a moment too late. And not a moment too soon. How often is it that Jesus reveals himself to us in the midst of the storm, the hardship, the adversity, in ways that may have been meaningless apart from the challenge? 
Hasn't it meant more to you when in the midst of the perils of life, Jesus shows up and he's the one that climbs into the boat with you and and then you know, ah, I can breathe again. All is well. This passage closes in a strange way. It, It closes with a disappointment, to be quite honest. Look at verse number 51. And he went up unto them into the ship and the wind ceased and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered for they considered not the miracle of the loaves for their heart was hardened. The passage ends with this strange disappointment. Yes, they were amazed beyond measure, left without words to describe what they had just witnessed. Why? Because faith is not the inevitable response of seeing God work. Faith is not the inevitable response of seeing God work. The disciples had seen God work in ways that few have seen. But faith is not the automatic response. They would eventually get it. So, you know, we we shouldn't be too hard on them at this point. They hadn't processed who he really was. The word hardened here, it means dull. Sometimes we would use the word calloused. Had they not just witnessed Jesus only the day before take a boy's picnic lunch and turn it into a buffet for thousands, what is it that he couldn't do? Let me ask you the same. What is it that he cannot do? With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So where are you headed? For some, you may be headed into a storm. Some are already there. Many, when faced with a storm, do do what a lot of the animal kingdom does, and that is they, they head in the opposite direction. We see them, they're, they're not certainly roaming as freely as they once did, but the, the buffalo, the American bison, is unique among, among animals in that when a storm comes, whether it be a heavy snowstorm, a, a, a thick squall, a buffalo actually turns its head to the storm and begins to actually charge into the storm. The, the other animals are, are heading in the opposite direction, but not the buffalo. It actually embraces the storm. And interestingly enough, it also gets out of the storm sooner than the animals that are fleeing it. It faces the storm, and as the storm comes, it's, it's moving, and it, and it actually passes the storm in a way that the others do not. You know, I don't know where you are today, but you may be trying to run away from your storm, and, and in fact, you may actually be prolonging that which the Lord wants you to learn if you actually just face the storm. There is someone who's going to meet you there. He, he knows you're there. He's seeing you toiling. He's praying at that very moment. And at just the right time, he will meet you in the midst of your storm. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord celebrates 40 years of telecasting the gospel worldwide because of your support. As a small way of saying thank you, we would love to send you our 2022 Rejoice in the Lord prayer calendar. You're invited to pray daily for Rejoice in the Lord and use this calendar as a reminder to make each day count for eternity. 
Your generous tax-deductible gift before the end of the year will help Rejoice stay on the air in your area. Ask for the Rejoice Prayer Calendar when you call, write, or visit us online.